I'm here today with our good friend Brian McLaren, a former college English teacher. Brian was a pastor for 24 years. Now he's an author, activist, public theologian, and frequent guest lecturer for gatherings in the United States and internationally. His work has been covered in Time Magazine, Newsweek, USA Today, The New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, and many other media outlets. The author of more than 15 books, including Faith After Doubt and A New Kind of Christianity, he is a faculty member of the Living School at the Center for Action and Contemplation. His new book is Do I Stay Christian? A Guide for the Doubters, the Disappointed, and the Disillusioned. I should also mention that Brian has spoken at several of our Writing for Life conferences and will be again at our September online conferences. Uh, you can learn more about Brian at brianmclaren.net. So Brian, thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, and congratulations on all your work. And thank you for all your good work. I'm looking forward to this next writing conference. You, you're, these do so much good for people. So glad to be part of it. Well, there's so much fun for me to do just because I get to hang out with great thought leaders like you all week. So that's just, you know, about the best way to spend my time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into your books, I mean, uh, could you give folks a little bit more on your background than what I kind of briefly touched on? Yeah, sure. So I started my career never planning to have a career in ministry. I, I wanted to be a college English teacher. I loved literature. Uh, I, and so I did that for some years. And But while I was a teacher, ended up uh, being part of this little group that started a church, ended up leaving teaching to become the pastor. Actually, first I did both uh, half and half, and then uh, became a pastor for 24 years. And during that time, I started writing and um and these last, gosh, 16 years, I've been uh, a full-time writer. And, you know, there are a bunch of causes that I'm committed to that I get to work on. And, uh, and these last, uh, I would say through my entire adult life, but especially these last six or eight years, it's felt like there was an acceleration of people who were struggling with their Christian identity. And this has been one of the deep struggles of my life. Uh, and uh, so that really is the kind of my, a whole lot of things in my background really came together to write this book. Do I stay Christian? So, you know, looking back, you know, earlier on, would you say that your kind of shifts in your beliefs were because of the books or generated the books? Yeah, I'd say more the latter. Um, although, you know, whenever you focus on something and really pay attention to it, it probably accelerates, accelerates the process. But maybe one way to say it is I was, a, uh, in many ways, what energized my faith and made me so serious and committed to my faith was that I struggled with it, you know, and that's, and, and those struggles with my own faith maybe is what made me more sensitive to other people's struggles and really helped me in my years as a pastor. So it feels like, you know, all of these things kind of uh, have synergized. I'm also really glad that I, I had that background in higher education where critical thinking oh. was not seen as a liability, but a requirement. You know? <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and I think for a lot of people, it's a struggle to put together honest critical thinking and a sincere faith. Hmm. So all of those things have kind of, uh, yeah, they, they've, they've, they've synergized. And I should also say, when you're a writer, as you know, you get in invitations to speak. And when you get invitations to speak, you meet people who've read your books who come to you with the next round of questions, which then <laughs> help you figure out what to write about next. So gosh, I just look back at my life and feel like everything has, you know, it's all just uh, been the right, e the right ecosystem to create whatever it is that I'm now doing. <laughs> well, you know, as I've read your books over the years, you know, you can see your train of thought evolving, your faith evolving, you know, through the books, um, which is a wonderful thing. And, you know, I think something to be admired, uh, quite Thanks. frankly. Thanks. So out of all the books that you've written, do you have any in particular that are your favorites? Well, you know, I wrote three, uh, what some people have called creative nonfiction or instructional fiction books, A New Kind of Christian, Story You Find Yourselves In, and The Last Word in the Word after that. I wrote those, I, the first one came out uh, just 20 years ago now. So, um, and, and the middle of those books was a book called The Story We Find Ourselves In. That book had a big effect on me. I think I sort of unleashed myself as a writer a little bit in the writing hmm. of that book. 
And then I wrote a book called Everything Must Change that was a book, the, the first book I got to write after I left the pastorate where I really got to be kind of a full-time author. Mm -hmm. And I, I literally spent months reading and researching and interviewing people and preparing to write that book. That book had a huge impact. The writing of it had a big impact on me. But I, I would have to say this book, um, Do I Stay Christian, feels like it's taken a whole lot of threads that I've been working on and, and brought them together. This is one of the most, it felt like one of the most important writing projects I've had. <laughs> well, I have to mention one that I'm sure is not one of your best sellers, but personally, I love it. And you know this, it's called Why Don't They Get It? Overcoming yeah. Bias in Others and Yourself. And it's, and you know, it's only an ebook, not, you know, kind of a traditionally published, you know, hardcover book or anything like that. But, you know, I just have so appreciated that thought that went into that book. Um, could you tell folks a little bit about the story behind that? Sure. So, um, well, and first I should say, I don't think that book would even exist in its current form if it weren't for your encouragement. For <laughs> well, I know I was pushing you to do that because I just yeah. thought your thinking around it, that the presentation I saw was so great. Well, I, uh, in around the time, actually the year before the election in 2016, when I watched what was happening in our culture, country and I watched what was happening in the political world, I just felt like we something almost revelatory was happening, meaning I was seeing something about how people's minds worked and how uh, and how people's minds changed. And uh, and it was very disturbing to me, but also fascinating to me. So I, I contacted a couple of friends of mine who are, you know, PhD psychologists and and uh, one studies neurobiology and and I said, look, if you could help me understand what you see going on with any articles you see that you feel as a professional, uh, as a scholar in your field, are you know peer reviewed, good empirical research, all that, would you send them to me? I also have a daughter who's a professor and, and mm -hmm. she's, so they all started sending me these articles. And as I read them, I felt I was able to articulate some of the things that I was observing. And I use the term bias just to mean glitches in our rationality. Um, that little, what we might call software flaws, you know, in our, <laughs> our rational software. And they're really predictable, a lot like illnesses, you know, certain things go wrong with your liver, liver, certain things go wrong with your stomach, certain things go wrong with your nervous system, certain things go wrong with our, our rationality. And, uh, and, uh, so that that turned into this collection of 13 biases. And, and actually, in Do I Stay Christian, I took that uh, little ebook and in many ways summarized it. I saw that. Yeah. Chapters. Yeah. 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 So let's get to the new book, finally. <laughs> um, so what really was the driving factor for you to write that? So I wrote a book before this called Faith After Doubt, and I actually sort of conceived of Faith After Doubt and Do I Stay Christian together for this reason. In Faith After Doubt, I wanted to give an overview. Uh, it, it's really a synthesis of a whole lot of scholars and researchers and theorists on human development and how that relates to faith development. And I presented this very simple four-stage um, framework for faith development, simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony. Um, and uh, without going into the details on those, what became really clear to me is that we have a lot of churches that work for people in simplicity. Um, and we have more and more churches that work for people in complexity. In fact, the megachurch phenomenon really, in many cases, is uh, for people in that second stage. But as soon as you move out of that second stage into perplexity and harmony, it is very hard to find a church that makes you feel welcome. Thank God there are exceptions. But uh, very many people, when they graduate stage two in their development, you know, they move, they, they in, in a sense feel I'm growing out of Christianity. And um, in the research for Faith After God, I read that about, that, that this was four or five years ago now, that there were, you know, well over 60 million, and probably now it's about 75 million adults in America who grew up going to church who, who do not go anymore. That's a big percentage of a 330 yeah, million uh, really? population. And, and the trend is getting close to 3 million uh, uh, adults per year hmm. leave their religious involvement. So something obviously isn't, isn't working. And, uh, and so that's what I wanted to explore. I, because here's the thing, 
faith creates problems for people. You know, it doesn't matter if you're Roman Catholic, you're Southern Baptist, or you're Muslim, or Reconstructionist Jew, or whatever it is. You know, you, 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 you grow up, you inherit a set of things. And what you inherit from your parents, maybe for some people, it's a perfect fit for, for you for your whole life. But for a whole lot of us, it isn't a perfect fit. And so religion starts to be a problem. And then people think, if I could just get rid of my religion, my problems would be over. <laughs> then it's just not that simple. So I wanted to write about the problem of religious identity, specifically Christian identity. And I wanted to do it in a way that wasn't telling people, you've got to stay Christian and here's why. You know, I'll force you through argument to stay Christian. No, I, I wanted to say, look, let's try to take this problem seriously. Let's, uh, and, and so the first part of the book is the, the the first 10 chapters are called no do i stay christian no and i try to give 10 i think very valid reasons for people to not stay christian next 10 chapters uh do i stay christian yes is it possible to have your eyes wide open to those first 10 chapters and still be able to with in good faith stay christian and then the last third of the book basically says, well, look, some of us are going to stay Christian. Some of us aren't. We still have to wake up tomorrow and figure out how we're going to live. So that part is called how. How are we going to live however we label ourselves in terms of our religion? I love the three-part structure of the book and you know the, the whole approach that you gave to that. It just makes you know great rational sense, as you said, you know, not trying to be telling people what to think, yeah. but helping them through how to think about this question. Yeah. And I feel like it, it you know, one of the things uh, I, I, you must think about this a lot, Brian, with the work you do with writers, but you know, the, I've been at this a long time. I've written a lot of books, but it's just dawning on me when I write a book, I'm basically inviting a person to step into my head for 11 or 12 <laughs> hours, you know, or, or I'm, they're, they're inviting me to step into their head for 11 or 12 hours, however long it takes to read the book. And that's a big deal. And it's a big commitment. And in some ways, what I wanted it to do is say, look, I've been thinking about this an awful lot, you know, in the wee hours of the morning, as well as in the broad light of day. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to say, look, here's how I've been grappling with this issue and, and in hopes that it'll be helpful to others. And I think that's just a really, you know, you're coming alongside people, right? You know, and, and, and I think that's just a really valuable accompaniment um, for anybody that just thinking seriously about some very complex topic like this. <laughs> so um, in the first section where you talk about reasons why someone might not want to stay Christian, one of the chapters is titled because of Christianity's real master money. Yeah. So didn't I read somewhere about that being the root of all evil? Uh, <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, don't you think that so many of our problems, our society's problems really boil down to money and power? Yeah, they really do. And in fact, it's right to put those two together, because in today's world, one of the things that money does is it gives certain people way, 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 way more power than anybody else. And a good way to define injustice, injustice is a harmful use of power, mm -hmm. a use of power in ways that brings harm uh, to others, benefit to myself, but maybe harm to others. And so um, learning how to live without harm uh, means that we have to challenge the whole value system that comes to us through a bunch of economic assumptions. And, and, um, and here's where it really gets tricky, because when you look at the first 2000 years of Christian history, uh, here we have this movement started by basically a homeless, wandering first century sage uh, that then amasses huge amounts of money, wealth, power, weapons, uh, and, uh, and influence. And, and so, uh, and, and when you study the first 2000 years of this religion's history, um, there's been a lot of injustice, a lot of harm that's been done with that power. And it's still happening today. And I don't mean to sound too ominous, Brian, but I also think one of my motivations in writing this book, in fact, this motivation has become clearer as I've been doing these interviews connected with release, is I'm really worried that the worst things that the Christian religion has ever done may still be in our future. Wow. And that says, that says an awful lot. When it you sure does. Past. And that's maybe one of the reasons why I took the risk of starting the book with 10 chapters to talk about, you know, 
to problematize Christian identity. Because my feeling is if we don't learn from the mistakes we made in the past, um, e either we're suppressing the truth, we're minimizing the truth, or we're just ignorant of it. And any of those options increase the chances that we could repeat some of the worst parts of our, our history. Well, it's really kind of ridiculously ironic, right? That, you know, a religion and a movement that start out all about love and against oppression by empire became the empire, yes. right? You know, and, and so we've been living in the latter stage for centuries now. Yeah. And I think it makes us blind. I think so. To the in fact, reality, right? I mean, yeah. In fact, you, you realize how a word like orthodox if orthodox or orthodoxy says this is the way christians have thought for a long long time and then you realize yeah and for a long long time we've been holding and abusing power in really questionable ways it makes you step back and say in fact when you realize that one of the ways orthodoxy has been enforced is through torture and murder and imprisonment. Yeah. I mean, this we really have a lot of history of this. There's a lot of evidence of that, right? I mean, yeah. It's not a small thing. And, and sadly, a lot of people, sincere Christians who go to church every Sunday, this just isn't talked about a whole lot, right? And, and they, they think that the only people who would talk about the dark sides of Christian history would be anti-Christians. Mm. But, you know, one of the things that I remember feeling enormously honored about as I grew older, both of my parents have passed away, but when my parents got older, they would start to be honest with me about issues in our family, both our nuclear family, but they would tell me stories about their parents or their grandparents. And I, it was funny. I started to be brought in as an adult to the family secrets. so to speak. And um, my gosh, I was just with someone uh, two days ago who over the last year of his life, he has been tortured with paralyzing uh, mental illness. Mm. Uh, and it's been there at a low grade, but the last couple of years, it's been super acute. Mm. And he had kept his secrets, uh, his struggles a secret. And he told his father a few months ago, um, you know, that he's been struggling with mental illness. His father told him he's been on medication for that mental illness for his entire adult life. Oh my he kept goodness. it a secret for his son. Oh, and wow. He, I mean, his son was so relieved to know, you know, that the, this family history, but you also just think by keeping that secret. Yeah. Um, and and I, oh. I feel like something like that has happened in, in the Christian faith. We've hmm. kept these secrets about things in the past or protestants like me what we did is we said oh catholics did that. right <laughs> right you know we protestants didn't and it was our way to to minimize any of these potential problems so one of my real hopes for the book is that it will be a way for people to yeah uncover some of those family secrets and and just become more realistic about about our faith and the result of that i don't think needs to be that a person says i don't want to be a christian anymore but i think it means i can't be a proud arrogant and naive christian anymore. <laughs> well even people that understand some of that history i think have a tendency to say well that was in the past you know that was centuries ago you know it's not like that now yeah there's no racism anymore right <laughs> you know or things like that right i mean that was slavery that's done i mean you know yes. There just seems to be this, you know, inoculation that we've all yes. received, you know, that, as you said, it's a mindset that was created in a certain context, and that context has been in place now for centuries, and it's, yeah. and it's toxic in a lot of ways. Yes, yes. And, and the fact that you hear that same script said again and again, it's in the past, it's in the past almost has the feeling of people who have been taught to convince themselves that it's yeah of course and and uh so all of this and provides just more evidence and 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 this is something that many sincere christians the kind of people who would never read this book um <laughs> they they can't understand you know they, they're part of that mindset oh this is all in the past this is other people's problem and um and then their children leave the faith and their grandchildren leave the faith and and at some point you you think maybe they're going to start to say maybe they see something i don't or maybe i'm only seeing part of the story and that's one of my one of my hopes is that uh that you know and and in fact it's one of the reasons why 
when people leave the Christian faith, I don't try to tell them to stay in if they feel they need to leave, because I feel like their leaving is one of the messages that the people in places of religious power, they need, it's the only way some voices will be heard is by walking out the door. And so I understand this, uh, it has to happen. Let me, let me put it this way. There are thousands and thousands of people who have been hurt by the pedophilia scandals in the Catholic church. And if, as long as they stay in a sense, nobody pays attention to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. If they speak out, they're forced to leave. And it's only by leaving that, you know, eventually some, there's some impact. And so I understand why many people have to leave. I just, uh, uh, but I also think for those of us who stay, well, one of the things I say in the book is that we have an option other than leaving defiantly and staying compliantly. Yep. And, and this is the option that I try to help people explore in that second part of the book. Well, you know, there's part of me that says that those children, those grandchildren, those people that have left have got a better chance of reclaiming Christianity than the ones who stayed. It's so well said. In fact, that's a really great point, Brian, that in the act of, sometimes it takes leaving to get enough distance to then say, I wonder what Christianity really should be. <laughs> when things get bad enough. Yes, you know? yes, so, yes, yes. But you have a, a really good, you know, section in your or, or, or chapter in your second section, you know, which is the one about reasons to stay Christian. That is the one that's the most meaningful for me. And, and you title it because of our legendary founder. Yes. Right. You know, which is to me, that's our hope. You know what I mean? Is yes. that there'll be enough people who actually really want to tr try to follow what Jesus actually led. Yes. You know, and that that's my hope, at least, of how Christianity can be reclaimed. I, I, I think so. And, you know, this, and, and this is so difficult right now, because so many people use the word Jesus as a weapon, even oh. in the insurrection on January 6th, you saw Jesus t shirts and people holding up crosses and Bibles and, and praying to Jesus or praying in the name of Jesus. And so even the word Jesus feels like so often it's been weaponized, but, mm. um, but what's really to me, and you know this too, Brian, from all of your reading and all the rest, but what's absolutely clear to me is that in the recent decades, largely through African-American, Latinx, Asian, indigenous, other people of color, women, uh, gay people who have gone back and read the story of Jesus and looked at the life of Jesus, like they're helping us see a fresh vision of what Jesus was about. And once you see it, you know, it's like, oh man, you thought Jesus was good before. Oh man, he's, you know, in another whole category, even better than that. And, and so um, that, that rediscovery is one of the great possibilities uh, for, for renewal. But it's, again, it's not easy because I just think of how many people hear the word Jesus and it's like, ah, I know what's coming next. That, mm -hmm. that name mm -hmm. always gets associated yeah. with something. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you're right. I mean, it's, it's a realization that I've come to, too, through doing all this work, is that I really want to listen to the people who have been marginalized. Yeah. Because, I mean, no offense to old white guys like you and me, but I mean, <laughs> um, I learn more from them. Yes. Because they're viewing things from a different perspective than this mindset that I grew up with all my life. Yes. And, and what's so interesting when you read the Bible is you read, realize that, oh, yeah, the whole story of the Hebrew people is the story of people who were enslaved and then liberated from slavery and then re-oppressed and reconquered and, and re-humiliated and yet didn't give up hope and didn't just seek revenge, you know, but found a, try, we're looking for a way to live faithfully in the presence of injustice. And, and um, so uh, you realize, yeah. It's almost like if if you have the wrong perspective, <laughs> you're you're never going to uh, have a, a deeper understanding of the story. Gosh, this hit me. I was a pastor in in 2001, and the week after September 11th, I was leading a Bible study at my church, and it was a study of the Book of Exodus by coincidence. <laughs> 
And the Sunday after September 11th, I'll just never forget as this group of, I don't know, 20, 30 people gathered and were discussing the book of Exodus. It was like we all saw it in a new light because hmm. we, we, we realized that what had happened with the attacks of September 11th was many of the dynamics that we were seeing play out in the book of Exodus. And uh, yeah, so it was hmm. uh, uh, help. It was one of the wake up calls for me to see the limitations in the way that I had been my whole approach to the Bible and the whole Christian faith uh, had been set up by my, by centuries of, of tradition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the third section, you know, as, as you said, you kind of cover the how, yes. what are some of the most important points that you make there? Well, um, I begin by inviting people to really uh have the, the the main idea that I talked about in faith after doubt, which is to say, all of us are in a process of growth. We're all in a process of maturity, and that that understanding helps us in two ways. First, it it helps us realize that I may not be outgrowing Christianity. I may just be outgrowing an early stage or form of Christianity. Mm. And so, I what I need to do is pay attention to my growth and expect that that is going to mean some adjustment in my faith. And it might mean needing to find new authors to read and new, uh, and maybe a new, you know, congregation to be part of or, or whatever. Um, but the, the other side of that is that, uh, uh, well, my friend Richard Rohr says it like this, the steps toward maturity are necessarily immature. And so <laughs> if, if we acknowledge that we're in a journey toward maturity, it helps us be mo more gracious with ourselves and with others by just saying, yeah, of course, that we, we wouldn't expect that every form of Christianity that's out there is equally mature. And so that helps us, I think. And if we leave Christian faith, it helps us understand, I could stay at a relatively low level of maturity as a non-Christian as much as I could as a Christian. And so let me, I've got to pay attention to how I'm developing, what kind of person I, I'm developing into. So that seemed to me to be one of the really important chapters. Another chapter I talk about, uh, I think the so much of our religious identity is formed through a language, a set of terms that have longstanding definitions. And we need something to help break us out of that language. And I, I talk about the importance of the natural world and experiences of the wild, because you know, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm visit. I'm, uh, we had a death in the family. I'm at my sister-in-law's house. I'm sitting here in, in a, a attic room and right outside my window all morning, um, a mother Robin is building her nest and I'm watching her come back and forth with a mouthful, a beak full wow. of uh, grass. And she's <laughs> perfectly forming this nest, you know, huh. and there, there's just something about watching what happens in the wild natural world that takes us out of the little box of religious language and arguments many of us are really really tangled up in <laughs> very cool so um if there was one thing that you wanted people to take away from the book what would it be i guess if you're going to stay christian do it with your eyes open and if you're going to leave christianity do it with your eyes open <laughs> um and that's yeah that's that would be one one important thing very cool so what kind of reaction you've been getting about the book so the book hasn't released yet. So, only, you know, there may be been 25 or 30 uh, podcasters and interviewers who have read the book who I've talked to. Gosh, it was very touching. Last week, one uh, guy who, a couple who have a podcast, the husband said to me, he had just finished the book that morning and just sat and cried after he finished <clears throat> the book. <clears throat> and he said it just, he felt something sort of break open in him and release. I think maybe to feel that some of his frustrations were validated and, and maybe a sense of relief. Gosh, there might be a way for me to be Christian that doesn't require me to be dishonest, you know? So, mm. so it was very, uh, very moving. And um, I had a guy, uh, a podcaster, uh, who interviewed me. And after we finished the interview, he says, you know, I really don't know if this book is going to do well, because I don't think people are ready for it. He said, mm. I think a lot of people aren't ready for it. He says, I hope it does well, because we need to be ready for it. And, and, um, and it, it was, you know, it was very heartfelt. It was like, I think an awful lot depends on us being ready for this kind of mm -hmm, message. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, ever since the days when you kind of left, you know, your more original evangelical yeah. 
world, you've been taking a lot of arrows, right? You know, criticism uh, for everything you do. Do you think that's going to happen again here <laughs> with this one? <laughs> I, you know, this is going to sound really sort of, uh, it's uh, it's going to just sound bizarre. I wish it were the case in this in this reason. Hmm. Um, I think what has happened in recent years is a lot of conservative Christians, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, they've circled the wagons and they don't read anything that's hmm. outside of the circle of a very small group of people who are considered acceptable, who say what they already think. It's that confirmation bias. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Come back in. And, and so what tends to happen is uh yeah they they just don't hear about it they just won't pay any attention to it which is why in many ways authors are always uh it, it, the the getting out of a book isn't just up to authors it's up to readers too who who read a book and think you know my cousin is ready for this book you mm. know my mm. my mom and dad are ready for this book or maybe you know, my, my brother is not ready for this book, but I think he needs to be. So, <laughs> you know, he's almost there and it's, uh, but, uh, and, and so I think if that, if it happens that this book gets into the hands of a lot of the people, maybe who need it most, um, it'll be because, uh, it'll be because of readers. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So I know you're in the midst of the launch of this, but you know, I also know that you're always thinking about the future too. Um, is there anything you can say about either, future books or other future projects? 24 hours ago, I could not have said this, but I, <laughs> uh, I just found out last night that uh, my my publisher, St. Martin's Press, uh, has agreed uh, on on uh, to my next two books. And uh, wow. So my next book, which I'll start writing probably beginning of next year, although obviously I've been thinking about this for some time, but it's called Life After Doom. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Uh, and so many people are waking up every day knowing we're in ecological trouble, we're in political trouble, we're in uh, economic trouble. And, and when you wake up having a feeling that the system I'm part of itself is, uh, is part of the problem, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's a psychological and personal and spiritual challenge. So that's the challenge. I, I feel it every day. And it's the challenge that I feel sort of uh, it's, you know, we all try to figure out what's mine to do, what's mine to do next. And that, that will be my next project. Very cool. Well, uh, we'll have to talk offline a little bit about that and uh, you'll be looking forward to your work on it. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Well, Brian, thank you so much. You know, this is just a, another masterpiece of a book. Um, again, the title is Do I Stay Christian? A Guide for the Doubters, the Disappointed, the Disillusioned. Um, I really appreciate all your work and for sharing it with us today. Always, always good to be with you. And, and thank you for all the good you do helping writers and through them, helping all the readers out there too. We're all in this together. And uh, my goodness, grateful for this time. Well, thank you so much.